Welcome to uh, week one, lecture number two, uh, Foundations of Christian Thought. Um, I trust that you're keeping up with your reading as well as um, Horton and Riken's book and that uh, these lectures will be of benefit to you. And just a reminder that the lectures and the reading will be the material that you will come across on the exam. So let's get started with our lecture today. I trust that God will uh, bless this time in, uh, in this part of your education. Um, we've been talking about worldviews. We introduced the idea of worldviews. And uh, so today I want to talk about what kind of worldviews are out there. Um, you know, Riken said it best in his book that there is no spiritual neutrality. So no one is spiritually neutral or abject of a position. And so with that in mind, worldviews themselves, as we articulate them, are inherently religious. And so I want to look at these basic categories of worldviews or religious views behind worldviews uh, that um, at least are made known to us today and, and will be the focus of our study. First of all, there's uh, pantheism, and we'll explain these in just a moment, so don't feel like you need to take notes at this particular time, but you'll see some more definitions as well as you see de um, these described in your reading. There's pantheism, panentheism, polytheism, monotheism, and there are a number of systems, religious systems, that fall under um, the monotheistic uh, view. Then there's naturalism, atheism, which would both come from the perspective of there is no God. And then relativism and postmodernism, which for me personally also would come from the view of no God, or at least a deist view of if there is a God, he's not active in uh, the world around us. So those are the basic categories we're going to be looking at today. And so let's uh, kind of work through those uh, one at a time. Pantheism and panentheism, uh, very close in, in name and in spelling, just a couple of letters different, uh, but the difference is crucial that you understand it this way. Pantheism from pan and theos is all God, um, that God is nature and nature is God, um, that the two are combined and uh, are basically one and the same, or that all is divine, everything created matter. So there is no, no distinction, excuse me, in regards to that. Also, this lends to what's called monism, which is a philosophical term that talks about uh, both mind and matter uh, being reduced to basically one essence or one substance or one principle of being. Whereas in Christianity, we see a dualism between God and his creation because God is altogether different than his creation, and then the second part of dualism would be the creation itself, whereas in monism, everything's all of one in the same essence or principle matter, and so that comes under pantheism. Also, you see some of the Eastern religions in regards to pantheism and the fact that, um, you know, with, with Buddhism, arriving at nirvana, which is their ultimate goal, is being at one with all of existence or all that we know. And, um, you know, it's supposed to be that state of perpetual bliss. But, but there's no distinction in regards to the two. It's just that essence of our, of our physical being becoming um, eventually spread out or connected or, um, you know, being reduced, as monism would say, to that, to that unity of being with all other things. So that would be pantheism. Um, obviously, the problem with pantheism, as I've mentioned already, for us as Christians, um, we believe in a dualism. We believe that God is altogether different than his creation by the very fact that he's the creator. He is the one who brought into existence all of creation. Um, and a term that's used in ex nihilio, Latin meaning out of nothing, that's the way we view God's creation. We view God's creation as he created all that we know in creation and as his creatures out of nothing. He spoke it into existence. 
um, panentheism. Um, it adds a little extra syllable in there about all in God. And being all in God, pantheism says everything's divine and that God and matter or everything that is divine is mutually dependent upon one another. Again, that's in opposition to our view of a, a dualistic position of realizing that God is altogether separate from his creation. Um, he's an essence and a being all to himself. And um, some of the religions that come along this line would be Hinduism, and then, of course, process theology, which uh, the danger in process theology uh, removes God's immutability or says that God is changing when we know that Scripture teaches us that God does not change. And so in process theology, it's this knowledge of knowing God as he's changing, and we form this knowledge or we're arrived we, we arrive at this knowledge as God changes and we're able to uh, to grasp uh, his his change or that process that's taking place. And um, a real danger there uh, in regards to process theology is that there really are no absolutes. And so it's this ever flowing or ever changing process and idea. So again, that would be related to some of the problems with uh, panentheism as well as the mutual dependence idea, because God is not dependent upon us at all. We are dependent upon him. He has brought us into being and into existence. So those are the first two there, pantheism and panentheism, in regards to uh, some of the religious aspects or um, spiritual views behind worldviews. And then there's polytheism. Polytheism is a belief that there are many gods there are multiple gods you see that in the ancient mythologies um, again you see it in hinduism uh, in buddhism and probably the group that you and i would encounter the most in mormonism because uh, mormonism actually not only believes in many gods mormonism would see god as one but even by their own definition they would claim that God came from a man with the idea that um, that uh, he was exalted in the most literal sense. Um, even the, the prophet Joseph Smith talks about the father having a body of flesh and bones and that the son uh, came from that but is a different person. And so there's there's this idea of, uh, of multiple gods, not not three in one, not the Trinitarian view that we take of God having the same essence, but um, is known in three persons. And so those are problems, not only um, biblically, but also uh, from the viewpoint of a Christian worldview in regards to there being many gods. And in regards to many gods, um, I have a dear friend who came to Christianity um, out of Hinduism. And, uh, you know, one of the exciting aspects of his testimony was that he lived in fear of which God he was appeasing or which God he was not appeasing, lowercase g. But then when the gospel was explained to him, he realized that God, capital G, the God that we know that that scripture reveals, is the one who not has to be appeased by us, but has granted us that appeasement or that propitiation, that expiation in the blood of Jesus Christ and that he was just called to repent and surrender. And so you see there, there's quite an opposite viewpoint there of this idea of the many gods and which ones would I even need to or want to or could satisfy when in fact the one true God has made that satisfaction known to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Some of the monotheistic views um, obviously would include Christianity, and um, our monotheism is set apart in the, in the fact that we see God, as I mentioned already, as the same essence, that's the mono, that's the one part or the single essence of God, and yet we know God as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now in Judaism, there's only one God, and uh, really, that's the foundation that we as Christians looking back at the history of the Old Testament can see um, the, that, that 
in the cultures in which they were surrounded um, that the um, Israelite people were surrounded by cultures of many gods, polytheistic cultures. Um, but God in Deuteronomy chapter 6 made it clear that I, the Lord your God, am one. And so this monotheism that we draw from begins in Judaism. But of course, um, Orthodox Judaism today would not recognize Jesus Christ as God and certainly not the Holy Spirit. And so Judaism is a monotheistic uh, viewpoint. Uh, deism is that idea that uh, there is a God, there's only, uh, and there is only one God, uh, but that God does not intervene or is not involved in the world in which he created. And then, of course, there's Islam, um, and their God, they claim to be, is uh, Allah. And again, only one God. Um, Islam recognizes Jesus Christ, but only recognizes Jesus Christ um, as a prophet and so does not recognize Jesus Christ as part of the Trinity that we in Christianity would recognize. So there are some monotheistic views, but even among those monotheistic views, our worldview or the worldview we derive, even from one of those monotheistic views, is going to be vastly different, um, again, based upon our view of God or our uh, spiritual or religious um, perspective that we're coming from. So we mentioned deism. Um, deism actually is a transitory form or a final form transitioned from Christian theism. Christian, Christian theism did hold that idea that um, there is a God and that God does interact um, with his, uh, you know, with his creation or can if he needs to. Um, but eventually through the enlightenment, um, and other philosophical aspects, um, there came to be this um, idea of deism. Now, modern day deism can be distinguished from de deism of a few centuries ago, but the idea is to understand that both a Christian theism and deism would recognize that there's a God, but would not necessarily again hold to and, and would not hold to the aspect of the Trinity that God has revealed himself in three persons, but also um, would not recognize the salvation aspect, uh, both of which would be works related that, that uh, in theism we can know from God what's good and what's bad and will be judged accordingly. And in deism that primarily from nature or from uh, the empirical world around us, we can know good from bad. And um, you know, if we do enough good, that will end up in heaven. Of course, again, we know the scripture does not teach that. The scripture teaches that um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And uh, also scripture teaches that it is through Christ that we are redeemed and forgiven. And so this transition from a Christian theism to deism came along the uh, time of the enlightenment, especially as both science and human reason were elevated above a view of God. Um, it's interesting with the picture that's here on the slides of John Locke and his essays. It says essay concerning understanding. That's really actually in, in a four book format. And you may be familiar with John Locke. Um, John Locke, if you have an educational background, um, he, his uh, philosophy of a blank slate or blank tablet, the mind of a a child upon birth is 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 null and void of the experience which would lead them to to go one way or the other that that children are born with a, a blank slate um, that comes in heavy in the educational philosophy that relies on John Locke in his writings also um, the history of the United States a lot of our uh, founding documents and founding fathers were heavily influenced by uh, his writing and his philosophy on governments. So if you've heard that name, um, that's where you've heard it, both from an educational standpoint or even from the essays that he wrote in regards to um, government. But in regards to uh, John Locke, it's that it's that idea that um, there is or can be a God, but uh, just because there's a God, we would focus on both science and human reason. And so he would distinguish himself from 
uh, being one who would call upon that which for centuries up until his time was a basis for understanding humanity and uh, what humanity brings about um, in regards to uh, human beings. Now, Locke himself might have claimed to be a Christian, um, but he saw reasoning, self-reasoning, and evidence from the law and from nature as being the way someone would arrive at God or a need for salvation. And so in his deism, he didn't deny that there was a God, but he leaned heavily upon human reason and the law of nature to bring about um, what they could know of God. And so for somebody like uh, John Locke, there was that aspect which would put him in that um, idea of, of uh, deism or that, that perspective of deism uh, because of his focus on reason and on natural law as to being the, um, the only substance we had as human beings to arrive at whatever conclusions we might um, arrive at. Um, there was another, uh, there was another almost contemporary, contemporary of John Locke um, named Edward Herbert. And um, Herbert had um, five different common notions in his understanding of religion that did include a supreme God. Um, and it did it call for piety of human beings in our, shown through our virtue and our good uh, behavior. Um, but, uh, and, and for that there would be a reward, but he didn't include any idea of a personal savior of which we would see, um, as only being in Jesus Christ. And so, um, uh, from deism, there comes many different aspects of who the God is that they believe God is and, um, different ways to arrive at that in regards to not only here and now, but, um, in the afterlife. Um, here's some basic beliefs um, of deists, that God created everything, but then stepped away from his creation, um, which would kind of be the, the Swiss watchmaker idea, that uh, once he made it and set it and got it running, that in and of itself it would um, perpetuate. Um, that God is just a mere force and intelligence, um, and that the universe is a closed system. Um, so this intelligence or this mere force that was God um, separated him from his universe because in the universe itself, there was this um, only law of science and nature that continued to operate and from observation and from what we could empirically know, um, that that's how we could answer or explain or give um, rationale for anything and everything. Um, and of course, this does not allow for the supernatural or for miracles uh, to be involved. So God's not involved in his uh, creation. And again, all of that summarized is the idea that God's knowledge or a knowledge of God, um, us knowing God, not God's knowledge, but us knowing God or having a knowledge of God would come through reason, science and nature with basically a dismissal of scripture as we look at scripture as the um, revealed word of God, the written word of God to us so that we might know him. And of course, it's works based. As I mentioned just a few moments ago uh, with guys like Herbert and Locke that, that um, in the afterlife, we're going to be judged on how much good we did, how much bad we did. And, um, you know, hopefully the good will outweigh the bad. And so we don't need a personal savior. We don't need someone to redeem us. Um, from where we are, and that through science and nature and natural law that the universe itself uh, tells us what's right and wrong. So there's not a, a dismissal of God. There's just not a God who's um, actively involved in his creation in regards to deism. And then today, I mentioned earlier that deism today really is a little bit different than uh, deism of the, of the past or of the Enlightenment. Um, so centuries ago, the, the, what would be called classical deism would be different today from a modern day deist, which the modern day deist would really eliminate that, the idea of any innate ideas 
or ignore them entirely, which kind of is founded in or would tie back to Locke with this idea of a, of a blank tablet in our mind. that There's nothing innate within us um, that would reveal to us right or wrong. And so that this God who exists today in this modern day moralistic and therapeutic deism is a God who exists, who created and ordered the world and watches over human life. Again, from a distance, not involved in. Um, also the fact that God wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other. Um, and I don't know about you, that kind of reminds me of my kindergarten teacher, um, that they that my kindergarten teacher wanted us to be good, nice, and fair to each other. Uh, but beyond that and some of the basic things that she taught me, uh, you know, the scripture certainly teaches much more than that. And again, it's it's only God wanting because God is separate and not intervening. And um, so in Scripture, we see uh, God's moral law set out for us in the Ten Commandments. And even, even other religions that would have uh, moral requirements or moral requisites uh, to live a life in line with what they think. Um, and that the central goal of life, this life, my life, is to be happy and to uh, feel good. That would be what is most important in regards to the modern day. And you can see why the word uh, therapeutic is in, in, included there. This, this moralism as well as this therapeutic aspect of um, the goal of my life is for me to be happy and for me to feel good about myself. And so if I have this checklist of do's and don'ts or this moral code from which I live, I can check off the things that I'm supposed to do and check off that I didn't do the things I wasn't supposed to do and as a result I can be satisfied with myself which of course anyone honestly and realistically who has dealt with sin in their life at a serious level um, realizes and knows that's not the case and um, that our sin cannot be dealt with in that way. Let me move myself so that you can see the rest of the notes here. Um, that God does not need to be particularly involved in, in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Again, I hope you see this idea of not only deism, but meism, that uh, all of the world, all of the universe, and even God himself centers around me, that God doesn't need to be involved in my life until I need him to resolve a problem. And um, that's the epitome not only of selfishness and pride, uh, but it's the epitome of everything revolving around me, everything existing uh, because of me and for my own good, and how then I can act and use and live that in a way, um, live those beliefs in a way that would somehow prop me up as the one who has done what I'm supposed to have done and done what I'm supposed to have done, and um, you know everything's good and happy as a result of it. Um, and then the ultimate belief that good people go to heaven when they die. Again, kind of tying back to the idea of, of the scales. You know, if I do enough good to overcome all the bad that I've done, and the problem there is you don't have that inherent, that inherent um, sin nature that the Bible teaches and that we as Christians view, um, because just by that inherent sin nature, we can't do enough good to overcome the nature in which um, we were born. So it's not just a matter of our actions, but it's at the very depth of our being and the very essence of who we are in that we were um, conceived in sin um, in the aspect of the psalmist as to saying, you know, I, I was born with this issue that God only you're going to be able to solve. And so uh, we see aspects of that today. And again, I hope you're, you're beginning to relate all these as to how different people are going to face the world from these types of viewpoints. Um, the naturalism, atheism, basic beliefs. Uh, of course, atheism stating that there is no God. And um, so as a result, um, matter is the only thing that exists. And uh, that would fall along with the natural law idea of everything I can know or everything I need to know come from, can come from the natural world around me. Uh, again, the universe is a closed system of cause and effect. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, but that man is purely matter without a soul. There's no spiritual element or no soul within a human being. And so death is the end. When it's done, it's done. 
Um, when, when I die, there is no more. I can't think of a worldview that offers less hope than just to say, um, when you die, you die. I, I think of that as a pastor, of people who are, who are in situations of suffering, maybe dealing with life-threatening illnesses or in, in um, personal situations that could be um, literally fatal to them, that there is a hope that the Christian worldview offers a hope beyond um, this world, and this is not the end, and this is not all there is to it. Um, but but what a fatalistic view um, just to see death as the end, especially for those who would spend maybe even a good portion of their life suffering. Um, because for to them, if death is the end and I'm suffering now beyond what I can comprehend, uh, where is my hope? What do I have to look to? What do I have to turn to? Um, this view also would come from the perspective of the world as we know it. Uh, in its normal state and can be known through autonomous human reason and science. So in other words, it's an elevation of self to say, not only do I rely on science and nature and natural law around me, but I can learn and I can be the one who knows from a diminutive point of view that, hey, this is this and that is that. Or or in other words, I can explain what's going on. So, so I've arrived at the top of the heap to be able to say I've acquired enough knowledge to explain how nature works and how natural laws work and and explain the theorems of science and mathematics and 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 again it's so self-centered um, as it would have to be just as a result of it not having any um, structural belief in there being a God. Um, history is seen as linear so there's no necessary purpose or design in the way that humans have lived and have um, lived since their um, inception here on earth, uh, but it's basically just a flat line. And if you know anything about the medical sciences, uh, when heart monitors flat line, there's nothing there. And so uh, they really see nothing in this aspect of history as being just a, a linear concept. And then ethics are all based on human construction. In other words, it's my thought, it's uh, it's your thought, it's maybe our discussion of thought, but it, it limits ethics and morality to um, what maybe I, you, or we collectively would understand as being right and wrong and how we're to live accordingly. Again, not only is that extremely self-centered, but think of the pride required the pride that would be required to say that me and you and, and just the right people and, and even to ask the question, well, who would decide what's right and wrong? And that, that anyone coming to the conclusion of, well, what we think is right and what you think is wrong, um, that would be the epitome of pride in regards to that. And of course, we know that sets us against or apart from God in that aspect. Um, relativism and postmodernism. Um, Immanuel Kant was uh, an 18th century uh, philosopher, and basically his work addressed the question of what can we know? Um, and he answered that question um, as simple as I can state it without making this a philosophy class, that knowledge is really just constrained to math and science and the natural and empirical world. And um, that had an impact on all of the world in the 18th century. And um, if you think back as we look at um, Immanuel Kant and in just a moment a few others, um, if you remember from our first lecture, the importance of a worldview is because truth does matter and ideas do have consequences. We mentioned John Locke just a few minutes ago and both in educational theory and in government philosophy, we still see his influence heavily upon these areas of practice. And so ideas do have consequences. And basically Kant um, just argued that, that the mind plays an active role or the mind is the active role in constituting the features of our experience and limiting uh, the mind's access is, is only due to uh, what we can know of the empirical realm of space and time. So in other words, 
Um, we can't have a knowledge of the realm that we are a part of or that we live in beyond what we can empirically verify. And so some of the ramifications of that are the moral actions or actions where reason and thought would lead rather than follow and where actions um, take other beings that would act according to their concept of the law into account. And so this was this, this modernistic thinking that, that, um, that really it was a limitation on, on reason. It was a move away from uh, the central tenets of faith, which faith that goes outside of reason that we could use from scripture to help us understand not only our life, but how we could live our life and that uh, we can only know that which we can experience. And um, Kant's writing affected culture, it affected the arts, um, obviously it affected philosophy and philosophical thought sense. And so uh, that's kind of the relativism and postmodernism, and it's, it's relative in the fact that we're limited to um, what we can know, and so everything that we can conclude is going to be relative to um, what we can know. I'm encouraged by the greatness of God when I think that just to dwell on him, who he is, and his person is so far beyond anything that I can comprehend. Or as you've probably heard it said before, I wouldn't want a God that I can understand. Because if I can understand him, that's going to be a very limited deity. And so um, Kant fell in that line of the deists or the deism um, that we were talking about before. And, and he even went so far as to say there's no, there's no way we could um, demonstrate a knowledge of God, um, you know, just from our own... Um, uh, just from our own capacities, just from our own ability to, to only deal within reason and within empirical knowledge. Um, it's interesting, though, he did believe in morality, but that morality was based on an individual's free will and rationality. And again, that makes it relative because my choosing and my rationale could be very different from someone else's choosing and rationale in any given situation. And therefore, that's going to make the, the morality um, very relative from person to person or from situation to situation. Um, in this relativism and postmodernism, we also had in the next century or not too long after, about 40 years after um, Kant passed, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, um, who came up with, or he was not necessarily the originator, but he... Um, is the lead name given to this idea of God is dead. Um, some would call him the originator because of some of his writing. But there were other contemporaries of his that had this um, same concept. And the idea wasn't necessarily that, that, um, um, that there was an actual God who ever existed and then died in the literal sense to begin with, but this idea that the Christian God and again, moving away from Christianity and the tenets of faith that it's so long been a part of, of everyday culture, that the Christian God is no longer a credible source of moral principle, or at least of absolute moral principles. And so um, the, the, this crisis existed um, in regards to that, because giving up of the Christian faith, one had to pull away from the right to a life based on Christian morality. And uh, as we know, and as we see in the relativism and pluralism of our culture today, that, that the effects of the results of those who have pulled away from um, a, an absolute moral uh, standard that we would draw from scripture, or at least absolute moral principles that we would draw from God's word, um, especially based upon, as we said already, God's moral law that's represented in the Ten Commandments. And so as a result of, of his influence, um, and again in this time period um, in the uh, late 19th century, that there was no longer objective truth. See, we use the scripture to be the basis for objective truth. Um, there's no longer objective truth and value and meaning or significance. Um, the absurdity and pointlessness 
of altruism um, because there's no moral universal law. So without um, any universal moral law, there was no reason for us to, there's no reason for a human being to be um, unnecessarily concerned with the benefit or the good of others. Um, another aspect is, is that man has the will to power and that power is known in, in what we can do, what we can achieve. Um, and unfortunately, it set a value system on the value of human beings and the worth of their existence, which I mentioned earlier in regards to that aspect of in relativism, if, if I decide what's right or wrong or you decide what's right or wrong or collectively a group, then where does the value of that group come in over the value of anyone else? When again, we know that the scripture teaches that all human beings um, are created in the image of God. And um, so that for us, for Christians in the world viewpoint that we are developing, it's this aspect of we're image bearers of God and that this places a, a value, a difference in value on the worth of existence in regards to human beings. And again, the, the idea is the struggle to survive and to thrive. Um, also that there's no such thing as objective fixed meaning in the universe, no divine revelation, illumination, or providence. So completely removing God from the picture in this um, postmodernism, in this afterthought of Christian thought and Christian life and, and Christian values being bases for uh, culture and for civilization. So again, as I mentioned before, I think we can see in our own culture um, some of the results of these thought processes and what they've brought us to. So what then is postmodernism? Well, postmodernism um, rejects a personal deity, um, that there is no God uh, that we can personally know, um, the philosophy, the philosophical naturalism, which is a philosophy based on natural law and uh, what we can know empirically and the um, methods of science and what we can be taught there. There's no universal human reason, objective truth or knowledge that um, as we discover our ideas of morality or our, our ideas of ethics uh, may very well change. There's no... Um, the, there's no metaphysical realism, which would go along with the philosophical naturalism, that uh, there's nothing outside of, of what we can physically know, touch, feel, and sense. And then um, also a moral and linguistic relativism, that um, words <laughs> may be different to you than they are to me, that, that a word that you would use may have a different definition that I would use, therefore right away we're, we're thrust into uh, confusion and, and loss in regards to our relationship and how we would deal with one another, not only as human beings, but in the world. Um, that progress is a myth, there's nothing getting better, and um, certainly if there's no God, there's no God's eye view. There's no perspective from outside of us, um, and that results in the religious pluralism and relativism because if there's no God outside of us, no God that is other than us, no God who is greater than us because he created us, um, then there's no higher standard. And with no higher standard, we come back to that relativism and that pluralism in regards to um, our view of the world. So how does postmodernism view man and morality? I like this little picture right here. Um, basically, man is making himself up in his own image, and um, that morality in a godless world is relative, that there are no absolutes, there are no objectives. And, um, you know, what a, what a dangerous, not only dangerous way to live, but again, a, a, a hopeless outcome for um, those who maybe are in the most difficult situations that, that their life would offer, and uh, they would have nothing else to look to or nothing else to place their hope in. Let me summarize um, from two quotes. Uh, Edward Wilson, um, 
Edward Wilson says, Enlightenment thinkers believe we can know everything, and radical postmodernists believe we can know nothing. And so when you think back over the last few centuries and the philosophical view that, that Wilson um, is expounding here, um, we can see that uh, even he, as he would propose himself to be um, one of the postmodern thinkers, um, you know, he, he would consider himself a deist, but he definitely denies um, labels, um, even denies and definitively says he's no longer a Christian, um, but that the belief in God and religion are products of evolution and how man progresses. And so even someone who would claim to be on one end of the spectrum that he speaks of, um, you know, gives us a, an interesting picture, an interesting summary in this statement. And then uh, Lyotard was a French philosopher. Um, he passed away in the late 1990s. Um, but he really is best known for his statement about the incredulity, incre incredulity towards meta narratives. Meta narratives being like the medical physical realm, those outside of what we can know through uh, through science and natural law that would bring an explanation or would be the basis, say, for us as Christians in our Christian worldview that God is altogether different but does intervene in regards to his creation, that, that none of that is realistic. None of that would have any meaning. And so I want to challenge you as you consider your own worldview. I want to challenge you as you begin to think through writing your own personal creed and what you believe. I want to challenge you with the aspect of being true to God's word and understanding that your ideas, even if you would say, that uh, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe in God, I don't come at this from a biblical worldview. Um, I want you to be exposed to that because in comparison to all of these philosophies and perspectives that we looked at today, they really answer a bigger and broader spectrum of the questions that a worldview would answer if you look at it from a Christian worldview as opposed to these, a number of whom which we've mentioned already would not even offer any hope in this life. And so as you're thinking through your worldview, as you're attempting to articulate it, as you are studying it um, through Riken's book, um, and then as you are beginning to develop thoughts and ideas for your own personal creed, I trust that God will bring you to that place where you have a greater understanding of who he is, a greater ability to articulate who he is, and that as a result, we would make a greater impact in this world because of our Christian worldview. Well, that's it for the lecture time. Let me encourage you to please keep up with your reading. Please don't hesitate to contact me um, via email or other contact information that you have listed on the syllabus. And um, I look forward to our time together again in the near future. God bless you.